Hello, I'm Atuba George and I'm so blessed to be bringing God's truth to you today. Now this is a new week and I'm sure you already know if you follow this broadcast that God has something special for you. Remember the Lord have said to us this month, I'm sending the rain. Praise God. Now, some of us, the rain have already started falling. Now it's the rain of the Spirit. But this particular rain causes things to be easy. Now, what does that mean? This is a month to expect any miracle that you desire from the Lord and believe it. Because he said, I'm sending the rain. The rain will make things easy. The rain will make your harvest come quicker. The rain will will cause your planting season to make sense. So this is one month you will sow and you will reap in the same month. Praise God. It's God's doing. It's God's doing. Hey, expect a lot. That's the reason why as we call for our daily bread, you should take it seriously. Are you ready? Join me in faith right now and say, Father, I demand for my daily bread right now. I know you have it in store for me. So I demand and I receive it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Trust me, a miracle is coming your way. I don't know what you desire from the Lord. I don't know what you've been praying about, but hear me. Things have been made easy for you. Whatever has been a challenge, this is the time to look at it again. You will discover it has been made easy for you. The wisdom of God will come afresh and it will come so easily to you. You will suddenly just know what to do. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we bless you, Father. Lord, you open your heart to us this week. And you pour out your knowledge into our hearts. And we receive all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Now, we've been talking about um, the rain. Preparing ourselves for the rain. So we say, when the rain comes. Now, there are certain things that we do that will slow down the benefit that we receive from the rain. You see, whenever God wants to do a new thing, your mind can become a challenge when it's focused on the old thing. And this is where a lot of believers have um, big issues. And and, and sincerely, I'm going to be talking to you from my heart. And I'm going to be pouring out things, thoughts the Spirit of God has shared with me over time concerning things like this. A lot of believers struggle. A lot of believers are not where they are supposed to be spiritually. Now, when was they not where you're supposed to be spiritually? Or not where you're supposed to be? Most times people think these things carnally. And you find out that lots of believers are actually covetous. And you remember... Um, Hebrews 13 tells us not to be covetous. Jesus taught us not to be covetous. Jesus actually said to his disciples, beware of covetousness. Beware of it. Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, let your manner of life, let your conduct be without covetousness. Now many things you think about covetousness is not so. You find that by, when we go in depth into the meaning of covetousness, you find that a lot of times you've been covetous and lots of people are actually covetous. So I was just saying something now. I said, um, many people feel they are not where they are supposed to be. Now, when you make a statement like that, people begin to think, actually, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. How? What do you mean you're not where you're supposed to be? Where do you think you're supposed to be? Guess what they will begin to list out? By now, I'm supposed to have built a house. By now, I'm supposed to have been married. By now, I'm supposed to... Why why those things look valid? Be careful that you are not thinking covetous thoughts. Now, how is a covetous thought? You feel by getting married, you will be somebody. 
that's covetousness. It's good to marry. Hear me? It's good to marry. But if you think by getting married, you will now become something. In other words, you've gotten an achievement because you got married. That Those are covetous thoughts. Oh, by now I'm supposed to know where I'm supposed to be in my profession. Now that can be covetous. Because you think by gaining a certain position, then you, know, you feel you have achieved, you have grown. Now, it's good to grow career-wise. But be careful. Now, that's Jesus said, beware of covetousness. Now, when he tells you to beware of something, he's telling you, look carefully that you don't fall into that thing because it's so easy for you to fall into the, that thing. Yeah. So, you think, oh, by now, I'm supposed to be a millionaire. Okay, so you're not a millionaire. So what's your problem? Uh, because uh, I know the things I would have done. Okay. Why are you not doing those things? Oh, because I don't have money. See, covetousness. See, covetousness is the thinking in your mind that with what you have or what you have attained, you will become somebody. See, that itself, tying your life and progress to physical attainment, physical things, is covetousness. Yeah. Because Jesus said, a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things that he, has, he possesses. So what you are, what you have gained, is not what makes up your life. It's not what, it's not, marriage doesn't make your life. You make marriage. See, because lots of people are married. And they are not enjoying the marriage. They are struggling in the marriage. Some are wicked to one another in the marriage. How is then marriage an achievement to them? You see, you're the one that make it work. Oh, I'm supposed to be a manager. Being a manager is not the issue. What kind of manager are you going to be? Are you going to use that office or position to really, really be a blessing to people? Or you're just happy you've attained because at that level, there's a certain amount of money they are going to pay you. Covetousness. Oh, I just need a better job. If I can just get a better job, I will. Uh, I'll be able to afford certain things. Pure covetousness. You can still achieve those things with your current position. Take, if you will just take out covetousness from your heart. Now, what I'm sharing with you may be hard, but he said these things will hinder the flow of God in your life. If you are covetous in your mind, it will hinder the flow of God. Everybody wants to have more. Everybody wants to, want to be rich. Everybody wants to be able to afford everything. But one ingredient you have to be careful about and deliberately take out from your heart is this covetous thought that I'm sharing with you. You listen to preachers, the testimonies we give, how our church have grown from this number to that number. There are pastors who feel, because I don't have a large congregation, uh, I'm not making it as a pastor. Covetousness. Oh, if I can just do some miracle power. So they fast and pray, give, oh, give me power. Every believer ought to have power and function in the power of the Holy Spirit. But when you now think that's what will make you somebody as a minister, then you're thinking covetous thoughts. Because everything you will ever be is already inside you. It's good to strive to do better. It's good to understand. But the thinking in your mind, now that's what drives a lot of people into preaching the messages they have no business preaching because they feel I'm not driving a very good car. I mean, if I, if I can drive now, I was talking to someone recently, we're just analyzing certain things. And I said, listen, you know, if, if someone just appears, you know, casually dressed and comes and, and, and people look at him now, he's a minister and people look at him and like, ah, what would this one say? Does this one carry anointing at all? 
Now, you see, the same person comes and brings like three security or protocol people. They stand before him, well suited up. And, and they are always, you know, like, ah, this is a very important person, you see? Now, the, we're talking about believers now. We're talking about believers. So they use those things to raise you. So you see, the people are covetous in their thinking because they are thinking covetous thought towards you. Now, this is what makes a lot of people do certain things they do, see? And you two thinking that when I appear like that, then they will know that I'm important. You are covetous in your thinking. You know, there are certain things we have to be careful about in, in the gospel. There are lots of things that have crept into the gospel on our ways. We were warned about this time. But did we pay attention? You know, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, you know, he said something. He said, having a form of godliness, but denying the power of thereof we were talking about the end times so there are people that are going to be like this they have a form of godliness take note of that statement a form of godliness let you know that there are many forms of godliness now he didn't say having godliness no he said having a form men have built different forms of godliness they tell you this you know, you know that's why you have and recently that has become so heightened in, in, in the body of Christ. You see, everybody wants to feel my own is the best or my own is, I have a better message than you, you have. So we find lots of people correcting each other. You see, now sure, a lot of people are saying uh, things that are not true. But most times, even those who think they are correcting those ones even go to the extreme and even enter into error also. We've seen lots of things lately, especially this, this idea of the church has gone nuts. So I have been sent to correct those things. No, sir. No, sir. Jesus is still building his church. And just like he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. So when you come and say, God has sent me to come and correct certain things in the church, I, I doubt if God sent you on that mission. Maybe you sent yourself. Yeah, because you see, the church Jesus is building is not, cannot be faulted. Allow Jesus build his church. There are many people you look around and you think they are part of the church Jesus is building. They are not part of it. They are not. So when we now burden ourselves so much and how to correct some people we think they are wrong, we get into error doing that. Because it's so easy for strife to enter into your heart. But here is one truth I will tell you. You know, uh, uh, first, second Timothy verse three, chapter three and verse five says, they haven't the form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Now, see, the form of godliness they have or they show is the form that denies the power of God in their lives. So that's why I said they have a form of godliness, but that form they have does not carry power. Now, when he says carry power, what does he mean? When you hear power, all you can think about is laying hands on the sick and doing stuff and people are responding. That's all you think about when you hear power. But hey, what about the power of the gospel to change you that is receiving the gospel? You that is the preacher. What of the power of the gospel to change you? And you believing that if that person carries the power of the gospel, we need to change him also. Now, the gospel is one. It doesn't matter what approach we bring into it. The gospel is one. There is only one gospel. And that gospel is preached by the Holy Spirit. You know what brings the division? Now, I'm going to go into things this week that some of you may not like. But, ah, you know, there's something the Lord told me one time. He says, 
Just preach what I tell you to preach. If they don't believe you today, they will believe you tomorrow. But just preach it. I said, okay. <laughs> it's good. So I'm going to tell you certain truths. This week, oh, this week we're going to open up things. If I believe the power of the gospel can change me, then I also should believe that the power can change you. So if you're preaching the gospel and I'm preaching the gospel, it doesn't matter what angle you're coming from. It doesn't matter what angle I'm coming from. If we can just keep our eyes on the gospel, we will grow to realize we are one. But what we do, and that's the temptation that comes to us, is the temptation makes us put aside the gospel and take up a form of godliness. So then I, I want to look at you because I feel you're saying the wrong thing. So I want to start looking at you and asking myself, does he pray the way I pray? Because the form of godliness that you have picked up is if I pray long, then I must be accurate. See? Another picks up a form of godliness. You, I, I live a holy life. Then I must be right. It's all a form of godliness. But then there is one thing you might be doing that you don't realize. You might, in your mind, you're not doing it deliberately, but this is the end result. In your mind, you are not believing that the gospel that person is preaching is true. What do I, what do I mean is true? That is from Jesus. Now, every preacher, every preacher ought to be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what's the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's not reading from the Bible. You're reading from the Bible doesn't mean you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. No. Preparing a very good sermon doesn't mean it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is simply this. I am preaching what Jesus has put in my mouth to preach. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is in Matthew chapter no, sir. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, why is it the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because it is Jesus that has given me what to say. So I come to you and I'm telling you like what I'm sharing with you now. I'm sharing with you what I'm sharing with you because while I was preparing and say, Lord, what are we going to talk about this week? The Spirit of God began to give me this. See? Are you getting it now? So I come to you in His name. For example, I've, though I've quoted the Bible, I've never even opened my Bible. But I come to you in His name. Now someone say, can you imagine he preached for a whole number of minutes, he didn't even open the Bible. That, that guy is not a preacher. Uh -uh. There's a question I asked myself many years ago. I mean, having known Christ, having walked with him, I asked myself many years ago. I think I asked if, uh, some, some, some brethren also, I said, have you ever imagined a world without the Bible? What would it have been like? And you know the normal answer. Ah, life would have been terrible. Life would have been terrible. Life would have been terrible. And I said, okay. Job didn't have a Bible. Abraham didn't have a Bible. Moses didn't have a Bible when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Joseph didn't have a Bible. Isaac didn't have a Bible. Now, these are men of faith. Elijah didn't have a Bible. Maybe, just maybe, the Bible might be our problem after all. <laughs> this is a place to stop. Praise <laughs> God. I got you. Praise God. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. We're going to continue tomorrow. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You are just the best. Thank you. And we give you praise for what you're doing in our hearts. Thank you. You're bringing so much healing to our hearts this month and bringing your truth in us. 
in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise God. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, God bless you. Bye.